dear friends, we gather this afternoon to remember and to celebrate the life of one who filled our world with her love, her goodness, her spirit, and her outstanding example. In humility and gratitude, we turn to the wisdom of our tradition for comfort, for guidance, and for understanding. Throughout the centuries, when our people felt lost, confused, grief-stricken, they would say, I lift my eyes to the mountains. What is the source of my help? My help comes from Adonai, maker of heaven and of earth. <clears throat> that you have regard for us? What are we that you are mindful of us? We are like a breath. Our days are as a passing shadow. We come and go like grass, which in the morning re shoots up renewed, and in the evening fades and withers. You cause us to turn to dust, saying, Return, O mortal creatures. Would that we were wise, that we understood whither we are going. For when we die, we carry nothing away. Our glory does not accompany us. Mark the wholehearted, and behold the upright. They shall have peace. For those of you for whom the 23rd Psalm is familiar, I invite you to join with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We've already begun to learn that in the rising of the sun and in its going down, we remember her. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we remember her. In the opening of buds and in the rebirth of spring, we will remember her. In the rustling of leaves and in the beauty of autumn, in the beginning of the year and when it ends, we will remember her. When we are weary and in need of strength, when we are lost and sick at heart, we will remember her. When we have joys we yearn to share, we will remember her. So long as we live, she too shall live 
for she is now a part of us as we remember her. When I die, remember me with a smile and laughter. If thoughts of me provoke no love, only sadness and tears. I ask that I be soon forgotten. Give what's left of me away to old ones, to children and old ones who wait to die. And if you must cry, cry for your brother or sister who walks in grief beside you. And when you need me, put your arms around anyone and give them what you need to give to me. You can love me most by letting love live within the circle of your arms, embracing the frightened ones. Love doesn't die. People do. So when all that's left of me is love, give me away. My dear Steve, Richard, Amy, Gloria, dear family, friends, as I sat with Jean Frumpkin's children and sister in the immediate aftermath of her passing, as we spoke of her many qualities and characteristics, her influence and impact on those she loved and those who knew her, as we traced the arc of her life from her earliest years to her advanced age. The descriptive word that was most ascribed to her, that her loved ones used over and over to capture something of the special characteristics of this towering, determined, persistent, and accomplished woman, was strength. She radiated competence, Ability, authority, capacity, probity, loyalty, empathy, and perfectibility. At more than one point in our conversation, Jean's dear sister Gloria reflected, when I think of Jean, I think of a woman of valor. In fact, as Gloria is well aware, a woman of valor who can find is the first verse of our tradition's incomparable paean to womanhood, found in the biblical book of Proverbs, chapter 31. What Gloria may not know, but serves to add to her association, is that the Hebrew, Eshet Chayo, which is typically translated as a woman of valor, could also and perhaps more accurately be translated a woman of strength who can find. There is no question in any of Jean Frumpkin's loved one's minds that they not only found a woman of strength, like the ancient heroine of Proverbs, she was also more precious than the finest jewels. Her husband trusted in her and thereby lacked nothing she did him good, never harm, all the days of her life. She perceived that her work was rewarding. Her candle burned on into the night. She was clothed in strength and dignity. She faced the future optimistically. She spoke with wisdom. The law of kindness was on her lips. Her children rise up and bless her. Her husband sang her praises. Many daughters have done valiantly, but you excelled them all. I rarely use this well-known text from our tradition, precisely because it is so familiar by virtue of its frequent, even overuse. But sometimes the text is so appropriately suited to the subject, as Gloria instinctively felt, that it would be wrong to avoid it. A woman of strength, where might we find her? As the eldest of Maurice and Miriam Saccharo's three children, Sister Gloria followed and then the youngest brother, Elliot. Jean was a real product of this community and of the upwardly mobile mindset of the largely immigrant generation 
of her parents. In fact, her mother, Miriam, was born in upstate New York, while her father landed in Cleveland via Eastern Europe and London, where he attended school. In fact, Maurice Sacharo, his three and his three brothers all attended law school in the United States and formed a law firm together. Sacharo, Sacharo, and Sacharo became quite well known as the first law firm in Ohio to defend a client accused of murder with the defense that it was by reason of insanity. As Gloria related, our father lovingly called Jean sunshine because she shone her unique special light everywhere and upon everyone. From her earliest years she loved Judaism and she loved to learn as she attended Coventry Elementary School, Roosevelt Junior High, and Heights High before going to the Ohio State University for a year until she had to return home to work. Nevertheless, she continued her education by mail before the internet and was largely self-educated as she never stopped reading, learning, and growing intellectually. Her father was a powerful influence in her intellectual development as he maintained a book bookcase of the classics and kept his favorite books, the Bible and the collected works of Shakespeare, next to his bed. One of Jean's more annoying habits was to monopolize the bathroom as she luxuriated in a beauty bath and a good book she had to finish. While the bond between sisters, Jean and Gloria, was especially strong, all three siblings benefited from the innocence and safety of a Cleveland Heights childhood as they enjoyed five-cent movies at the Cedar Lee, reading at the Coventry Library, making and eating fudge, ice cream at Meathers, or 10 cents worth of chocolate malted milk balls, Jean's favorite at the corner candy store, playing tag and statue in the backyard, walking barefoot in their pajamas on a hot summer night down the cool great grassy strip in front of their house on Washington Boulevard. Gloria remembers taking tap lessons with Jean at the Fred Astaire studio downtown, and one particularly energetic afternoon of dancing at home with their mother at the piano, when Jean's shoe flew off her foot through the window and into the neighbor's yard. As her sister acknowledged, whatever she did, she did 100%. Her candle burns on into the night. While Jean was already on her way to becoming a future woman of strength, her destiny was profoundly affected when her mother became critically ill with spinal meningitis when Jean was just 13 years old. With her mother grievously ill or convalescing for months and even years, and with her father completely consumed by Miriam's status and care, Jean stepped up, became an adult overnight, and cared for Gloria, Elliot, their father, and the household. Her strength was forged in the crucible of that terrifying time of her mother's illness. Her worth to her siblings and the family was incalculable calculable, as it would be as she continued to grow and mature. As a student, she loved ancient history and Judaism. Upon returning to Cleveland from college, however, she worked for a time as a bookkeeper at the Alcazar Hotel. After Steve and Richard grew up, she became the co-owner of a ladies' retail handbag store at the Van Aken Center in Shaker Heights, the bag store. When she and Bill moved to Sarasota some 38 years ago, in addition to her extensive volunteer activities, she was the benefits administrator for Kane's Fine Furniture until her retirement. She perceives that her labor is rewarding. Her candle burns on into the night. She was quite impressive when it came to all she could handle and all she could accomplish. As a lifelong member of Anche Chesed Congregation, first at the Euclid Avenue Temple where she was consecrated and then at Fairmont Temple, Jean taught for many years in our religious school. She loved our congregation 
and was devoted to making it the finest congregation anywhere. Following her example, both Steve and Richard were confirmands and graduates of our Temple High School. In addition, after high school, Richard studied for two years with Rabbi Lelyveld in a small group of about a dozen students. Both of Jean's sons were exceedingly well-educated Jewishly. She would have nothing less. In addition to teaching, Jean served as the president of our congregation's PTA. She chaired the Purim Carnivals, was a devoted member of our sisterhood, its board, and ran the gift shop. She was one of the few women in our, in our congregation who served on the temple's board of trustees. She is clothed in strength and dignity, and she faces the future cheerfully. She speaks with wisdom. The law of kindness is on her lips. She was so admired and respected that Rebecca Brickner personally selected her to be the first president of the Women's Association of the Cleveland College of Jewish Studies, which Rebecca had almost single-handedly founded. In Sarasota, her love of and devotion to education led her to the Women's Association of Brandeis University, which she served as regional president for several terms. It seems that the organization did not want to let her go. The law of kindness is on her lips. Wherever she went and whatever she did, she was beloved for the depth of her commitment, for her embodiment of Jewish values, for her passion for Jewish tradition, culture, and Jewish life, for her respect and regard for every human being, for her stellar example of constantly striving to engage in tikkun olam in making this world a better, gentler, kinder place in which to live. As serious, focused, and intentional as she could be, she was the one who insisted that her children study during the summers and made sure that they both spent summers in Israel as teenagers. She could be wonderfully social, outgoing, and fun. Whenever she attended services at Temple, she closed up the building as she had to talk to every person present. Her family called her Mrs. Fairmont Temple as she was a one-person hospitality committee. Jean's hospitality started in her own home, which was meticulously appointed and ordered by her other persona as Mrs. Clean, and always open for holidays, celebrations, and special occasions of all kinds. Both Jean and Bill had wonderfully large extended families. On Jean's side, the Sacharo sisterhood grew to include Gloria's husband, Joseph Frankel, Zichro no Livracha, and her children, Jesse, now married to Diane with Rebecca and Matthew, Julia, whose children are Michael and Jeffrey, and David, married to Kathy with daughter Ava. Brother Elliot sends his love from Parkland, Florida with his wife, Sydney, as he is not well. His daughters, Vicki and Robin, also remember Jean's delicious table at Rosh Hashanah and breakfast for numerous picnics when the family gathered at the Frumpkins' pool. Jean loved her nieces and nephews and was dearly loved in return as Julie visited her often in these last years of decline, and we are so grateful that you are here today. On the Frumpkin side, Jean was not only beloved, her gefilte fish was legendary at the annual Sukenic Seder, where 100 family members would gather to observe our festival of freedom. Only the initiated knew to take two pieces of her fish at the outset, because it would be completely devoured by the time anyone might like a second piece. Perfectionist that she was, whatever came out of her kitchen was delectable. Her children rise up and bless her. There was something formidable about Jean as a mom. She was not warm and fuzzy, but she was present, 
She was clear in her expectations and standards, and she created a strong, vibrant Jewish home and a secure and rich childhood environment. Steve and Richard remember Shabbat dinners at temple before services, strong family ties, a fine Jewish education, and a strong, determined mother at the center of their lives. When she took them out of school for a month every year in the winter, in order to go to Florida, Jean would convene school every morning so the boys wouldn't miss anything while they were away. For Richard, Jean is like the biblical judge, Deborah, wise, strong, a towering figure, a leader and teacher of her people. She seemed fearless, indomitable. She gave her sons goals for which to strive and rejoiced with them in their accomplishments. She also welcomed her daughters-in-law, Barbara, Barbara Pinza, Mimi Epstein, and Amy. We know that Amy's son, Gabriel, is sending his love from the USS Abraham Lincoln, on which he is serving our country in the Leyte Gulf, Gulf off the coast of Iran. Our thoughts and prayers are with him. She adored her family, every single member. But grandson Joshua had a special place. And Steve shared with her the joyous news that Josh and Tina had welcomed her great-granddaughter, Evelyn May, or Evie, into this world just three months ago. Joshua still remembers visiting her in Florida as a child when he and Richard would visit the Circus Museum and other favorite destinations. Her husband trusts in her, and so he lacks nothing. She does him good, never harm all the days of her life. They met at Ohio State. He was five years older than she was as he was a veteran, attending school on the GI Bill. Even so, she didn't think he was serious enough. So she actually dumped him for a while with the unspoken message that he had, that he had to get in line. It seems he not only got in line, but went to the head of the line as they were married on August 21st, 1949 by Rabbi Sam Silver of the Euclid Avenue Temple. Bill had majored in architecture and became a builder who built both of their family homes as they welcomed the greatest blessings of their lives, Stephen and Richard. They shared a wonderful life of family and community engagement, of friends and faith, of worthy endeavor and accomplishment. They traveled to Israel and traveled the perimeter of this country from the southern states to the coasts, to North Dakota, Minnesota, and back to Cleveland. In 1968, they bought a condominium in Florida with Fred and Muriel Rivshin. But when Bill decided to retire, they built a house in a golf club community and loved their life there. They particularly loved to walk on the beach, which they would do for miles together and on Sundays with groups of friends. They loved Sarasota and loved to welcome family as Gloria, Richard, Joshua, and Tina would go down to visit as Elliot and Sydney were not far away, and as Steve's presence became a special gift, particularly in these last years, as he watched over Jean on behalf of the family, her guardian and protector, as she had been a generation and more before. She speaks with wisdom. She would often say, if you expect nothing, You'll never be disappointed. You can change only yourself. And what is, is. Which this afternoon is a woman of strength who can find. Her worth is beyond measure. Her husband trusts in her, and so he lacks nothing. She does him good, never harm all the days of her life. She perceives that her labor is rewarding. Her candle burns on into the night. 
She is clothed in strength and dignity, and she faces the future cheerfully. She speaks with wisdom. The law of kindness is on her lips. Her children rise up and bless her. Her husband sings her praises. Many daughters have done valiantly, but you excel them all. Zichrona Livracha. May the memory of Jean Florence Saccharo Frumpkin, our woman of strength, be always for blessing. And let us say, Amen. <clears throat> O God, you give us loved ones and make them the strength of our life, the light of our eyes. They depart and leave us bereft on a lonely way. But you are the living fountain from which our healing flows. To you the stricken look for comfort and the sorrow laden for consolation. O God, we see life as through windows that open on eternity. We see that love endures and the soul endures, as you, O oh God, endure forever. We see that the years are more than grass that withers, more than flowers that fade. They weave a timeless pattern in a world that is the dwelling place of your love and glory. Please rise. <coughs> if you are able. You <coughs> God, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to Jean Frumpkin, who has entered eternity. O oh God of mercy, let her find refuge in the shadow of your wings, and let her soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is her inheritance. May she rest in peace. And let us say, The family has asked me to share with you that they will be returning to Fairmont Temple immediately following the internment at Mayfield Cemetery, where they will receive visitors until 
actually until the service this evening, which will be at 6.15, which they will attend. <laughs> 